You know, I don't often chastise, chastise the church, but you missed a wonderful opportunity to say amen right there. Would you just join me in saying amen? amen? What a beautiful, beautiful anthem. You know, even from the very first hymn this morning, you missed an opportunity there to say amen. Isn't it good to be here in worship today? It is dreary outside, it's chilly and misty, and we're here together, and we're grateful that you're here for this worship. You know, if you were not here this past Wednesday, you missed another wonderful opportunity to worship together. We had Ash Wednesday over in the Great Hall, and it was one of those times where we united the entire church family. Stephen led in worship, Han O oh led in worship, the Espanol team was there, they led, and the pastor gave a wonderful message about Lent. Now, some of you say, excuse me, we, we don't do Lent. We're Baptist. That's what they do. We don't do that. I would challenge you, next year you ought to be there. Wonderful, wonderful time. And one of the things that the pastor did is, in talking about Lent, he helped us understand it's about entering into a season of renewal prior to Easter. You come to the Lord in repentance, that you exercise restraint. You exercise restraint in something maybe that you love. Now, a few years ago, I loved Diet Coke. I gave it up. Now, I went back to it after Lent, but I gave it up for that season. And so whenever I wanted to Diet Coke, I'd go, you know what? I I just want to say thank you, Lord. I want to say thank you, God, for all of your grace extended to me in Jesus. And it really did enrich my season. And it becomes a season of renewal. So as we enter into this run towards Easter, slow down. Slow down. Take the opportunity to prepare your heart and your life for what is to come. Now, we're beginning a new series this week. It's called The Verdict. Now, in our last series on the I Am Statements of Jesus, we looked at what Jesus said about himself. Last week, the pastor was in here, and he spoke out of John chapter 15, I am the true vine. Well, today we're going to be looking at what Jesus says about us, and for the next five Sundays. So, please try to be here. If you're not here, watch us online. We want to greet all those online today, or just go to the website later on and watch the series because you're going to see what Jesus says about you. And today what we're going to do is we're going to see what he says about us in terms of our secrets. And that he says that we can be free from the secrets that sometimes so define our lives. So if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18 for the first of the six trials of Jesus. Now, when we read this in just a moment, this trial is only found in the Gospel of John. It's not mentioned in in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But John places it in here, and I'm, I'm grateful for that because I believe it brings some context, and it also ties up some loose threads that are present within the Gospel. And as you study this and you study the central character, you understand more than maybe you did coming into this service. So John chapter 18, verse 12. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and they brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Now, when we come into this passage, what you're going to see is there is a man by the name of Annas, and Annas is a man of secrets. You know, at one time or another, we all have secrets. I can remember back 39 years ago, I had a secret. This was a good secret. I had determined, after quite some time, I'm told, but I had determined I wanted to propose marriage to Maria McCann. And I had purchased a diamond. And on March the 31st, I took her to dinner, and by the end of the evening, we were engaged, and we've been happy ever since. At least I think we've been happy ever since. You'll have to ask her her opinion. But there was a secret that I didn't know I was keeping. So when I had determined to ask her to marry me, there was a lady that worked in our church office. She managed the finances. She knew what I made, and she knew I wasn't going to be able to afford much of a ring. And so she came to me, and she said, Rodney, Howard, that's her husband, he managed a bank. He deals with an estate jeweler, and he can more than double your money in what you might buy should you choose to want to buy a ring. 
Well, I looked at her hands, and she had some mighty fine rocks on that hand, and I thought, okay, I'm going to trust Howard. So on Saturday, I met Howard and Glenda at the bank. I took my pastor. I don't know what he thought he knew about diamonds, but he went with me, and we looked, and they were much larger than anything I would have ever dreamed that I could afford. So I found one, and I said, that's it. They took the diamond out of the setting. They all looked at it and said, this is flawless. This is a perfect diamond. I paid for it. I purchased a little porcelain box, and that's what I gave it to her, and she loved it. Well, then the next night, we go to Lenox Square Mall. This is in the Bucket area of Atlanta. We lived in Atlanta at that time. It would be likened to this area. It would be like North Park, going to Iceman's or something. So we went to the mall, and she picked out a setting. It was a full store. So the lady takes the diamond, she takes the setting, she said, I'll be right back. And she comes back within less than a minute and she said, now sir, and she says it very loudly, her chin kind of up, are you sure you want to put a cubit zirconium in this nice of a setting? My now wife probably should have been in the neck brace. She turned to look at me so quickly. (laughs) What have you pulled? I said, ma'am, that... That is not a cubic zirconia. That is a diamond. They told me it was a diamond. She said, son, this is no diamond. That rock had a secret. Now, the good news is she believed me. I did get my money back. We went to another jewelry store. We didn't stay there. And I would say that we bought a far more understated diamond ring than maybe we were looking at initially. And all has been happily ever after. But I had a secret. And that secret had the potential of devastating me. All of us in one form or fashion carry secrets. And the gentleman we're talking about today, Annas, had a secret. Annas was not the high priest, it said here in the text. Annas was the father-in-law of the high priest. He was the father-in-law of the high priest. So look back there again, John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. And it says, then the detachment of soldiers with its commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. So there in the darkness, following Jesus, leaving the upper room and coming down to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he's arrested. He's there in the darkness. They take him and they take him first to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest. Well, why? Well, John alone tells us this. If you go back to John chapter 2, so go back in the gospel, look in John chapter 2, and you're going to see the beginning of of a conflict between Annas and Jesus. In John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, it says this, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves and others, sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of courts and he drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? So what's happening here? Jesus, as any Jewish male, is required to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. He comes. It's not his first time in the temple. But as he comes in, he sees that the court of Gentiles is the outer court of the temple that was a place designed for Gentiles to come as close as they could to the worship of the Jewish people is now filled with cattle and sheep. There are money changers. It is dirty and it's noisy. It smells. And Jesus reacts. Jesus drives them all out. Well, why? How did this happen? It happened because of Annas. It happened because of Annas. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, you read that the Jews were to bring of their flocks the very best unblemished animals. But you know what? If you live down in Jerusalem, that's a long way to be bringing your sheep. That's a long way to be bringing your dove. And so over time, it changed, and you could purchase one there, and you could bring it up. Well, Annas comes along in 6 AD when he is made the uh, high priest by Herod the Great, and he decides that he could make a buck off of this. So he turns that court of Gentiles into a market. And what would happen is, you could come, you could purchase your animal there, you could take it right in, and you could offer it for sacrifice. Now, if you happen to bring your own animal, what would happen is, the priest could look at it and say, no, this is blemished. You need to go out and you need to bring another one in. 
Well, guess how often that happened? So it says there's money changers there. What's happening? Well, this would be the season in which you would pay your temple tax, and it had to be paid in the local currency. So people coming in from outside would need to have currency that was local, and so there were money changers there for their convenience. But what was happening was they were charging exorbitant fees. And so what was happening is there was money coming in all across this season, and guess where it was going? It was going to the family of Annas. You could almost categorize them as a mob family, and Annas was the godfather. So Jesus comes in, and he clears them out. He confronts it. Well, what is he doing? He is confronting then Annas. And Annas is like any good godfather. He doesn't forget. He doesn't forget. So you go on to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, a few weeks ago, Travis was in here, and he preached the story of Jesus looking at Martha and saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you remember what he did? He went to the tomb where Mary and Martha's brother was laid, and he called out, Lazarus, come forth. And Travis said, if he hadn't said Lazarus, they all would have come out. And that's true. Lazarus, come forth. It is a time of celebration, but not for everyone. Because in John chapter 11, verse 49 and 50, you see the leaders are gathering. And they say this, Then one of them, who was Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. He said, you know nothing at all. You don't realize that it's better for you for one man to die for the people than the whole nation perish. Well, what's he responding to? Well, the people and the leaders had looked around, and just prior to that, they'd said, listen, if he keeps going on like this, everybody's going to believe in him. And what's going to happen to us? And not only that, what are the Romans going to do? It's going to appear there's something going on. We'll lose both our place and, they said, our nation. But make no mistake about it. It was about their personal privilege. So in John 11, verse 53, it says, From that day on, they plotted to take his life. So what you see here is that from the very beginning, Jesus is at odds with this leadership. And here in John 11, what you see is that the trials that are to come are nothing more than a sham. It's been predetermined. He has to die. He has to die. And so you leave John 11 and you go into the rest of the story. And what I want you to do is turn back to John 18. In John 18, you find that Jesus has been arrested. And he's been brought out of the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's been brought to Annas. Now, it says the high priest here, but it's referring to his past role as high priest. So look with me in verse 19. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus said, I've spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why are you questioning me? Ask those who've heard me. Surely they know what I said. And when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is that the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So you see at this moment, Jesus is brought in to the man of secrets, to Annas. Annas has lots of secrets that he's hiding. And Annas questions him, seeking to build his own case. But I want us to pause for just a moment, and I want to talk about what secrets do to our lives. I've asked Brad Schwal to come. Many of you know Brad. Brad grew up in this church. He served on staff here. He's now president and chief executive officer of the center. They're our partner in our counseling ministry. And six days a week, there are counselors here on this site to assist you and to assist the members of this church and this community. So, Brad, thank you for being here. Thank you. And as I thought about this, and I've considered secrets, there's got to be a toll to secrets in our lives. What would you say as a counselor? So whenever we have perhaps broken a boundary or a trust, or perhaps even something has happened happened to us, or maybe we're even struggling with something, a depression, anxiety, or addiction, and we keep that to ourselves, we are, are partitioning off a part of who we are, and that keeps us from being vulnerable, 
which keeps us from having healthy relationships. It also keeps us from truly experiencing the love, the unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace that God gives us. So when we have something with which we're struggling and we're keeping that from others, that shame and guilt keeps us from living the full life that Christ promises us, and it keeps us from then also having relationships with others that are fulfilling. You know, I I would assume that when you're looking at the secrets in your life, there's a certain amount of guilt and shame that go with those. What would you say about that? Guilt is when we have done something, uh, we have crossed that boundary, and it can be an appropriate experience. Shame is when we believe all of who we are is not worthy. Shame also happens perhaps when somebody has crossed a boundary with us and we take it in as our fault when it's not, and that guilt is unnecessary. That shame might also be because we believe that that we are the only ones having the experience that we're having. And even the psalmist talks about when we keep our transgressions from God and our bones waste away, we physically, and that is true, that by keeping secrets, that shame, that guilt affects us physically. Uh, But the psalmist does go on to say that when we do open up to God and, and we do confess, God forgives the sin but also the guilt Uh, which leads to freedom. So Brad, as we we talk about secrets today, if if this has struck a chord with anybody, what you've said or what they're seeing in scripture and thinking about their own lives, and they want to contact the center, take advantage of the, the help and the counseling that's available, what would they need to do? So first, so important to have people in our lives, friends, spouses, family with whom we can be real and honest. The therapists that we have at the center who are at our church, as well as across the community, are here to help people unpack what they are experiencing process so they can reconnect with God and with others. The church website has a landing page that goes right to a link to information about the center. Um, Our phone number um, is there on the site. You can go to our website and look at the various therapists that we have here, uh, as well as even from McKinney to Waco and Garland to Arlington. Important to know for our counseling, that's for kids, teens, and adults, we do take insurance. And with psychological evaluations and resources, um, our goal is to make counseling available and accessible. The goal of our therapists, uh, we're, we're Christians, is to honor faith because we believe that we cannot separate our faith from what's happening in our lives and by relying on our faith um, as we grow, as we heal, again, we are able to live the full life that Christ has promised us. Brad, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And again, you can go to our website at pcbc.org. There you go. Okay, you took my, my chastisement on the amen well. Thank you. Okay, amen. Thank you, Brad. But you can go to our website, and again, it will link you to the center. And this is one of the great opportunities this church has had in the last years. So spiritually, how do we deal with the secrets in our life? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. We read what the Apostle Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus. There's some, there's some counsel here for us. So beginning in verse 8, he says this, For you were once darkness... But now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But with everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. And this is why it's said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ shall shine on you. It appears there at the end, Paul is quoting from an early Christian hymn. So look there again in verse 8. For you were once darkness. Now I want you to notice here, Paul doesn't say you were once in darkness. He doesn't say you were walking in darkness. He was saying before you have trusted Jesus Christ, you were darkness. I came to faith in Christ in 1976. What this tells me is I was darkness. I was the problem. I was the problem. And so he says, for once you were in darkness. And what we need to remember, our friends, is that secrets grow in darkness. 
Secrets grow in darkness. And the more secrets we have, the more closed off that we become. And secrets thrive in that darkness. You know, as I went through the John passage, it struck me even one more time that what you see there is that all of those events took place on that last night before the cross. They took place in the dark. They took place in the dark. Jesus was arrested, what? Under darkness. He was bound. He was taken up to Annas in the dark. The five trials that would follow that, all in the dark. We read in Matthew chapter 26 that in the dark they were seeking false witnesses against Jesus. You see in the scriptures that they were also seeking to raise the crowd to call for Barabbas. And that for Jesus to be crucified, all this happened under the cover of darkness. So how do we confront darkness? You know, one of the great things about being the preacher is every now and then you get a perk. And the perk is you can say, Stephen, I sure wish you would sing this. And that hymn that we sang earlier, And Can It Be, I love that hymn. But, you know, as I thought about it and I looked at it, I realized that Charles Wesley in the third stanza speaks to what we're talking about. You may not have noticed it when you were singing it. You were caught up in the melody. I was listening to you. But you sang these words. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. And what we need to understand is, that light, when we come to Christ, was not in us. Pop psychologists would tell you, you have that light within you. Embrace that light. That's not what's being talked about here. But it's the light of Jesus Christ. And praise God, it is a light diffused by His mercy and His grace upon us. And so Paul could say, as you come out of darkness into life, in verse 8 he says, then live as children of light. So what does that mean? Well, last weekend here, Pastor Jeff was talking about what it means to abide in Christ. We talked about repentance, coming to Him, confessing our sins, seeking Him, trusting Him as our Savior, as our Lord. We seek to follow Him. We seek to follow Him. We seek the light of His Word. We open our hearts to the Word of God. We seek to live obediently. We seek Him in prayer. And we seek Him honestly in prayer. We confess our doubts and our fears and needs. We come to Him. We're real. No secrets. No facades. And we ask Him as a child of light to help us live like light. You know, last week in that message, Jeff said this, God shows up where he's wanted. You know, to me, every good sermon ought to leave you chewing on something. I've thought about that phrase all week long. God shows up where he's wanted. Do I truly want God in my life? Or is this just something I can do on my checkoff list? Been to church this week, I'm great. But if I truly want God in my life, that light's going to show up all in my relationships. It'll show up at home. It'll show up here at work. It'll show up in my, my uh, leisure time. It's going to show up. I'll lead my business life differently. It's true for an individual. Honestly, it's true for us as a church. Do we truly want God to show up? Now, all of us would say, absolutely. That's, that's almost heresy, Rodney. But, but it's one of those things to think about. You know, one of the things that's troubling in our culture today is there are churches all over this nation that are closing. Their doors are shutting. And I believe one of the reasons they're shutting is they came to the point where their past was more important than their future. And what we need to understand is, as bright as our past was, and I'm a student of the history of this church, I love our heritage, but I am excited about our future. I'm excited about boys and girls. I'm excited about what God is doing in this day. And as we invite God in with us, there is a future and there's a hope for this church. We, again, are walking in light. Look in verse 9. In verse 9, he says, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, as I thought about that this week, I thought Jesus exemplified all of those. Jesus was all. Jesus was good. What's goodness? Goodness, if you really boil it down, is love in action. It's love in action. Love shows up. Jesus showed up. He calls us to show up. And when we are walking in his light, he said there's a fruit. There is no fruit in darkness. 
There's no fruit in darkness. You require light for a vine to produce the fruit. For a plant to produce the fruit, you have to have light. So there's goodness. Righteousness. Jesus was righteous, and in Him, I am cloaked by His righteousness. I have right standing before God through Jesus Christ. I recognize that through the light of His Word. He was truth. He was truth. Jesus conducted His life with perfect integrity. It's why in John 18, He could look at Annas and He could say, I said nothing in secret. Nothing in secret. I taught openly in the synagogues and in the temple and where all the Jews gathered. He was a man of integrity. You know, your mom used to say, if you never tell a lie, you never have to remember what you said. Jesus never told a lie. We're called to bear the fruit of truth. And we do that as we walk in the light. Now contrast that with verses 11 and 12. Because in verse 11 and 12, he says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Well, what does that mean? It means that as I walk in light, my light will expose the darkness around me. It's why when you show up as a follower of Jesus, you know what? It can be a different conversation. You know, it's really funny. Not so much anymore it used to be, but it used to be I could walk into a, a group, and I've heard Jeff say the same thing. Stephen would say this. You'd walk into a group outside the church, and all the guys are talking, and all of a sudden somebody goes, oh, be careful, here comes the preacher. It was a joke, but you know what? Light. Light. We are called to expose the darkness by the way that we live. He says it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. So there's light. So let me just ask you a few diagnostic questions. I'll start off easy. Do you make yourself the hero of every story? Do you make yourself the hero of every story? Do you seek to present an image of yourself or of your family that is ideal? I mean, June and Ward Cleaver would be really impressed by your family the way you describe it. Do you hide hide the reality of life? Because you know what? No one's life is perfect. No one's life is perfect. And yet there are whole industries that have grown up in these last years to make us look perfect. Well, to look perfect, then you've got to have a secret. You've got to have a secret. So do you inflate your achievements, your resume? You know, there's a congressman right now in Washington trying to explain why he lied about his resume and all of his achievements. What would your coworkers or your partners or employees say in terms of your integrity? Are you known as a person of integrity? Are you a person of your word? Do you conduct your business dealings, your dealings within your home well, with integrity? So key to living a life devoid of secrets is this, that your tolerance for sin rather than going up goes down. Because as our tolerance for sin goes up, the secrets build up around it. So I'm going to reframe that more positively. Do I seek to live a life that is marked by righteousness? By righteousness. Do I seek out relationships? You know, I love the worship experiences of Park Cities. I love the sanctuary. I love the Great Hall. If I understood the language, I would love the Spanish language, I'm sure. I love them. But to me, the beauty of this church, apart from the wonderful worship experiences and messages that we have, is the relationships that are built up in connect groups. Are you in a group that people can open up their hearts and expose their pain? You know, for years, I've taught a connect group. And for years, it really was more of a lecture. That was what they wanted. But then there was a day that someone cracked open the door to the pain in their life and others stepped through. And a group became a family. I was talking to someone this past week and he said, Pastor, you'll never know how much our connect group has meant to us. They are walking through this season. They are loving us. They are supporting us. Well, how does that happen? It happens out of honest relationships. You need to be in a group. And if you're not, find one. Let us help you find one. What we're saying here is secrets can destroy you. And the reality is you very rarely are able to successfully keep secrets. People know. 
People know. And even if they don't, there's going to be a day coming when all secrets are laid bare to the light of God. God knows. And for Annas, as he stood there cloaked in his pretentiousness and pointing his finger at Jesus, Jesus knew the heart. He knew the corruption that was Annas. And one of the sad things in this sad story is this, that the corruption that was really cloaking Annas' heart was passed to his children. I'm sure to his grandchildren. He had five sons. They all followed him in the family business. They all succeeded one another as high priests. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, there's the sixth one right there. Josephus records that in the year 62 AD, that Annas' son was responsible for the martyrdom martyrdom of Jesus' brother James. By this time, they called him James the Just. And there are those historians that would say that was one of the straws that broke the camel's back with the Romans. And just as they talked back in John chapter 11, what will Rome think? Well, at this time, Rome acted. And you may know that by the year AD 70, Jerusalem was taken and the temple was destroyed. Their secrets brought them down. But my friends, what we need to realize is we don't have to live in our secrets. Just as Brad said, there is freedom. Christ sets us free from our secrets. So how do we do it? You know, I don't know about you, but this past week, on the days that it got really warm, did you enjoy that? Wasn't that nice? It was like a foretelling of spring. Now, I know what's going to happen in a few weeks at my house. My wife is going to want all the windows cleaned. And what do we do in spring cleaning? We open the shutters. We raise the windows if we can. We open the doors. We let in all the fresh air of spring to come in and refresh us. So I want to go back to the beginning of this message. Allow this season of Lent to refresh your heart. Take advantage of these days. Take advantage of reading Scripture together. I've had so many wonderful comments about these cards that people are enjoying reading Scripture together and knowing that the church family is with them. If you don't have one, they're available out in the narthex in the lobby area. Or as you go out, they should be at all the guest centers. Take one of those. Join the family in reading Scripture. Ask the Lord, what would you have me do? And then follow Him in obedience. What are you doing? You're letting the light of Christ come into your life. You're letting the light of Christ come in. You follow Him in in relationships. Again, seek out accountable relationships. But there's one thing to do. If you're here today or you're watching us online and you've never come to that point where you've crossed from darkness to light, let today be the day. Let today be the day. Confess your secrets. Come to God in repentance. Ask Him to save you, to make you His child. And if you're here, we'd love to talk with you about that. I'll be out in the foyer after this service. Would love to talk with you. We'll have others that are out there as well. If you're here today and you've never become part of a church family, this is the place. This is a place where you're going to love and be loved. It's going to be a place where you can grow in your relationship and your relationships with others and be a part of a church that is seeking to be a transformative presence. Today could be the day. But it begins with a decision. And the decision is all ours. Let's pray together. So, Father, as we come to the end of this service today, I pray for each of us that we would seek you. That, Lord, we would ask right now, what is it that you would have me do? And that, Father, we would follow you in the light that we have and take that step. For those that are in here today that need to talk with someone as a professional, a counselor, may they take the courageous step to contact the center. For others, whether it's join the church, whether it's trusting Christ, or just determining, I'm going to use this season to expose my heart and my life to the light of Jesus. We trust you in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.